Welcome everyone to this introduction to R. Now, uh, this uh, set of notes here inspired much of my Appendix A of my analysis of categorical data with R book. So, if you happen to have a copy of that book, um, uh, you will see some, uh, some similarities between the two. I'm not trying to plagiarize my book because actually this introduction to R uh, came first. Uh, but the, the appendix um, does provide some additional information. So if you're looking for an additional resource, that might be um, something to obtain. Uh, the book is available at many fine retailers. Okay, so one of the first things obviously you have to do is to install R. Uh, you can uh, download it, uh, the Windows-based version, uh, from this web address here. Let me bring over my window. And just download it. Uh, it's an executable file, just um, uh, in install it with all the defaults and everything will work out fine. Uh, this is, uh, you will get two different versions of R, 32-bit uh, and a 64-bit version. Either version will work fine for our class. Uh, there are other versions of R available, such as uh, for Linux and Apple computers, and you can go to the R website to uh, find out how to download those as well. Okay, so let's talk about some of the basics of R. So I already have R open here. Um, this is what it looks like. We have what's called the R console window located uh, right here. And what you see uh, towards the bottom of the window here is a command prompt. Um, normally there will only be one greater than sign there. For some reason I have two greater than signs right now. Uh, and and this is where you can type commands uh, to uh, do various calculations. And in fact, you can use this command prompt to uh, basically act in the same role as a calculator. So for example, if I type two plus two, you get the number four back. Uh, if I type, let's say two minus three divided by six, you get the appropriate value. But you can also do, for example, log one. Um, log means natural log in R, so log 1 is equal to 0. Uh, you can do, let's say, 2 raised to the third power, you get 8. Um, you can also find a quantile from a normal distribution, or I'm sorry, a probability from a normal distribution. So for example, the probability that a normal a standard normal random variable, let's call it Z, is less than 1.96 is 0.975. A quantile from a chi-square distribution, let's say if I want the 0.95 quantile with one degree of freedom, is 3.84. Hopefully the, those two uh, values look very familiar to you. Um, now at times you like to be able to save the results that um, that you obtain at this R console prompt. And so to do that, you need to create what's called an object. Uh, that's uh, using R's terminology. And so I'm going to create an object, and for the lack of a better name, I'm going to call it save. So I'm going to say save, and then I can do a less than dash to make the assignment where I want to assign the value of 2 plus 2 to save. And the way that this is read then is save gets the value of 2 plus 2. So the less than dash, which kind of looks like a, a left arrow, so meaning 2 plus 2 goes into save, that less than dash is read as the word gets, G-E-T-S. And so if I hit enter, notice we do not have a numerical result come back to us. That's because the results are saved in save. Uh, so that's a, a handy tool to have uh, and you'll see why as we go along through this uh, introduction to our uh, set of notes. Now this object save is stored in R's database. Um, if you're familiar with SAS, this is kind of like the work library. To see the contents of the R database, you can type ls parentheses and parentheses, ls standing for list, and you see that save is in there. You can also type objects, parentheses and parentheses, and again, you get the same thing 
back. If you ever need to remove an object, you can just type RM parentheses, then the name of the object. Okay, so now R performs a variety of different calculations uh, through what are called functions, uh, somewhat like PROX in SAS, but uh, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot bigger in scope than that. And so we've seen two R functions already. Uh, we've seen the P norm function and we've seen the Q chi SQ function already. Um, let's and, and, and one of the nice things about R is that you can actually write your own function uh, that you can use at a later time. So how about we write a function to calculate a standard deviation. Now there's already a function called SD that will do that. Uh, but let's create a new function called SD2 that will ca calculate a standard deviation to illustrate the process. Now, in order to calculate a standard deviation, you need some data. So I'm going to create an object called X, again for the lack of a better name, uh, that's going to store my data. And so I need to make this assignment. So X gets, and then I'm going to put my data. Uh, there's a variety of different ways to uh, put data together into like a what you can think of as a data set. Um, and I'm going to use the simplest using the C function. C standing for combine or concatenate. And so how about my data set just simply consists of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I just simply separate them by commas. So if I hit enter there and then type X, you can see that X indeed stores my data. To find the standard deviation, I'm going to create a function called SD2. SD2 gets a function. And um, if you're familiar with languages like uh, C or um, a, a variety of other uh, programming languages out there, you know you can write functions or procedures or routines that allows you to pass information inside of it to do some kind of calculation. And so in R here, this function is going to contain a particular item called numbers. Now I'm going to pass into this function, this, my data, uh, which with inside the function is going to be called numbers. And then to tell R that I'm going to start uh, um, uh, writing uh, the code inside the function, I'm going to use a, a left curly bracket and hit enter. Now notice R doesn't come back to a command prompt that greater than sign. Rather, it comes to a different kind of prompt, a plus sign. What this is representing is then that R is waiting for more information. So, you know, add more information here. So I'm going to um, now write the code to calculate a standard deviation. And I'm going to do it really, really simply, where I'm going to take simply the square root of the variance. And so there happens to be a function R called SQRT, parentheses. I want to now calculate the variance. So I'm basically embedding a function within a function. So I'm going to take the square root of the variance of the information that's in numbers. And then I have matching parentheses uh, shown there. I hit enter and R says, okay, I'm still waiting for more information. Well, we're actually done. I'll use a right curly bracket and hit enter. And now my function called SD2 is shown right there. Now uh, I can use this function as SD2 parentheses. Remember my data is stored in X and there's my standard deviation. Just to check it, suppose we use the regular standard deviation function SD and I get exactly the same thing. So now let's uh, write a, s a slightly more complicated version of this SD2 uh, function. So again, SD2, SD2 gets function. I'm going to pass in information corresponding to numbers. And this time, one of the first things I want to do is actually print the data when the functions run. Uh, there's a variety of different ways to do that. One way is to use what's called the cat function. 
So I say cat parentheses quote print the data. And I'll, uh, I guess you could say a little trick in R and R to, uh, to let's say move the cursor down to the next line in some output that's being displayed is to use the slash n uh, command, then end quote, comma. I'm going to put in, well, what's going to be printed, numbers, comma, quote, and I'm going to go down to a new line again. Then similar to before, square root of the variance of numbers. I'll end my function. Let's actually check it out. It looks good, and let's run it. And so you can see the data was now printed. Now, if I want to, let's say, save the results uh, from using the SD2 function, I can do, uh, we'll just use save again for the lack of a better name. Save get SD2, uh, parentheses, X and parentheses. And you can see, still we have the data uh, being printed because we have asked it to be printed, but notice you no, no longer see uh, the actual standard deviation being printed. That's because it's located in save. Now, how did R know to put in save just the standard deviation versus, you know, maybe uh, what's shown there in terms of print the data, give the actual data set? Well, this then leads to a very important point of using R, and that is functions return to the user in, order, uh, in terms of uh, being available to be saved into an object, functions return the la what's in the last line of the function. So since square root variance of the numbers was in the last line, that's what was then put into save. Uh, a very important point, and we'll see that throughout the whole semester. Okay, so now let's say that you want to um, access R's help. Uh, there's a different, uh, a variety of different ways to do that. Uh, my favorite way is to come up here to help. And you can see here there's a, a whole bunch of different um, uh, help mechanisms. So, for example, manuals to using R are available uh, there. But we're going to click on HTML help. And it pulls up a nice little web page um, that... Uh, allows you to access again a whole different a whole bunch of different ways to access the help and in particular we're going to look under reference packages now if you're familiar with SAS you know that SAS is broken up into different components such as SAS graph, SAS stat, SAS QC, SAS OR and so on well R is broken up into different components as well and they are called packages and so one particular package that will be used a lot is one called uh, stats. So let's find the stats package here. Actually, let's see. Let me actually keep on going down. Uh, so I'm going to go to stats package here. And uh, we're going to find one of the functions that we've used. Remember that p norm function. And so all these are functions inside the stats package. And let's find pnorm. There we go. And now we've uh, come across the help for how to use the pnorm function. And since uh, the pnorm function uh, that finds a probability associated with a normal distribution, you might think that's you know, closely related to find out a quantile or maybe simulating random uh, data from a normal distribution or finding the, let's say, the f of x value or the density value for a normal distribution. Uh, because of that, you can see that there's a whole bunch of functions corresponding to the normal distribution all shown here. Let's focus on the p-norm function. And what we see here is actually the corresponding syntax to using the p-norm function. So q corresponded to our quantile that we had. Remember that 1.96 that we use. Um, but also you see some other uh, options or what are called arguments um, in, in, uh, in R uh, for this particular function. You see one called mean equals zero, SD equal one. Well, since there are arguments with values after them, these are the default values. So you don't have to specify you want a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Uh, R will automatically assume that. 
but you could, if you wanted to, change it to a different mean for the normal distribution or a different standard deviation for the normal distribution. So let's try this out here. So we had P norm 1.96 before. Okay. Now if I say P norm Q equal 1.96, this is more specific and it corresponds to what we saw in the help that Q corresponded to quantile. So again, the, point nine, uh, uh, the probability of being uh, to the left of 1.96 is 0.975. So that means the 0.975 quantile of a standard normal distribution is 1.96. I could also type mean equal 0, SD equal 1. I get exactly the same thing. Um, in fact, I could do this too where I remove those argument names and get exactly the same thing. Now I prefer to always use this kind of syntax here rather than this particular syntax because what R does, if you don't supply the uh, argument name, uh, it will match up the argument values that you have here corresponding to the order that was listed uh, in the help file uh, for the for the for the function, and a great way to avoid mistakes is to always specify the actual argument name. Uh, so let's see here. So note uh, uh, one way that I can quickly cycle through old uh, type code is if I use my up arrow or my down arrow. So if I go back up to there, and let's say that I said mean of two instead. Well, you can see now the probability changes. If I change my standard deviation maybe to 10, again, the probability changes. So let's go back to the help here. So in the help, you see corresponding arguments. How they're described, uh, what, they, what these names mean. You see some details. You can see a, a crude uh, way of writing out the normal distribution. Uh, talks about what values are returned uh, by a particular function, um, some references, some more information about how the stuff is done, and also here you see some examples that you can copy and paste into the um, uh, the R console and and see what the code does. That's a great way to learn about how to use R. Now another way that you can access the help for a particular function is to use help p norm or help then the, the name of the function I should say, I should say to be more general. And there you go. Um, my preference is to actually you know find the particular uh, package that uh, that a function is, is in and um, and, and, and uh, and then find the help for that particular function as well. So you can see here there are uh, uh, lots and lots of R packages. Uh, by default, the ones that you see at the bottom here, by default, these R packages are automatically installed when you install R. All the packages that you see above here are ones that I've installed myself and I'll show you how to do that shortly, uh, uh, from actually downloading them from the R website. These particular functions are actually written by users. In fact, um, at the time of this recording, there were over 5,000 functions, I'm sorry, 5,000 packages uh, that have been written by users. And that's one of the reasons why R is so popular is because um, R provides an easy mechanism uh, for users to extend the base capabilities of what R can do. In fact, I've written a, or I've been a co-author on a few packages myself. So now we're on about page nine of the notes, right about here. We're going to talk about how we can use R functions on vectors. So if you're not familiar with the term vector, just think of it as a kind of a, a a group of information uh, such as uh, maybe in this case here if you notice I'm combining negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 into 
uh, like a data set. Um, if you're familiar with vectors in a more mathematical sense, you can use that definition as well. So one way that R then uh, simplifies some of your calculations is to its ability to uh, work directly on vectors. And let me actually, before I move on here, let me turn off my spell and grammar check so we can remove some annoying squiggly lines on the screen. Okay, so what I mean by this then is that we've seen the P norm function before and instead of maybe just putting one quantile in the function call, I could actually put two, three, or as many quantiles as I want. And then I have the corresponding calculations done for all of the quantiles at the same time. So for example, if I copy and paste this into R, you can see that um, uh, I get both uh, the uh, 0 0.025 and 0 0.975 quant um, uh, probabilities uh, corresponding to the negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 quantiles. So I get them all at once rather than having to do it uh, one at a time. Uh, also, uh, we have a new function here called a QT function. Uh, this finds a quantile from a T distribution. And if I want the 0 0.025 and the 0 0.975 quantiles, then with nine degrees of freedom, uh, I obtain a negative 2.2. 26 and positive 2.26. So let's look at a, a simple case where uh, using uh, this uh, way of doing calculations with vectors can be very helpful in R. So let's uh, find then, let's say, a 95% confidence interval for a population, population mean for a given data set. Uh, just a second here. And so here's my data. It's in a vector. Um, I'm combining 3.68 all the way down to 1.25 into a, a simple data set. Now, there are 10 different data values there. I'm going to put in a value called x. Let me go ahead and copy this over to r. And there you can see my vector of information. So that's my data set. Now let me get back here. And what I'm going to do is now find a confidence interval for a population mean using this data. Let me just copy and paste all this over to R, then I'll explain each part of it individually. So first of all, you see the function mean. As you might expect, it finds a mean of a set of numbers. My, again, my values are in X, so the mean of that is negative uh, 0.631. Notice how there's only one value there. Um, and then as we saw earlier, to find a quantile from a t distribution, I can use the, uh, the qt function. And if I have a degrees of freedom of 9, or alternatively, suppose I find the length of x, which would be 10, because there are 10 items in x, minus 1 to find the proper degrees of freedom, using the, um, which is uh, using the regular old formula for a confidence interval for population mean, then I get my two quantiles back. We see the SD function again. That finds my standard deviation of x. Now look what happens then when I take these two quantiles times uh, the standard deviation of x. What R does, it performs then these uh, calculations as you kind of would expect. It takes the negative 2.26 number times 5.69, and you get the negative 12.88. But then it also takes then the 2.26 number times 5.69 again uh, to get positive 12.88. So this helps simplify some of your calculations rather than working with, let's say, uh, one quantile at a time to do this multiplication. I can actually work with both quantiles at the same time. Now up here in this expression for the regular old confidence interval for a mean, uh, you can find the square root of the length of x. In other words, that's the square root of n. So again, uh, the length of x is 10. Then we can combine the quantile and the standard deviation times then the 
or I'm sorry, divided by square root of the length of x. And again, notice how R does its calculations. Obviously, the square root of the length of x is one number. Uh, but this quanta times that standard deviation gave us two numbers. And so what happened was negative 12.88 was taken divided by 3.16. And positive 12.88 is divided by 3.16. So the, at the last part here, I need to take the mean of x plus then uh, this expression here. And notice again how R does its calculations. It simply takes negative... 0.631 plus negative 4.07 and also negative 0.631 plus positive 4.07 to get then the confidence interval for a population mean using again the usual old formula um, and so you can see how you know the way that R does its calculations can you know simplify um, simplify how you do your coding I mean, this is a, an extremely simple example here, but you can imagine in other settings uh, more complicated where you have lots more sets of information uh, that you have to combine. You can see how this uh, uh, can simplify things. Okay, so let's next go to page 11 of my notes. And we're going to talk about packages. As I mentioned earlier, um, R is um, uh, made up of packages, similar to how SAS is made up into components like SAS Graph, SAS Stat, and so on. Some packages are automatically installed with R. Uh, other packages are written just simply by users, and you can download them from uh, the R uh, website and install them on your own computer. And so we're going to talk about how we can use or how we can uh, download and install one user contributed package called CAR which uh, stands for Companion to Applied Regression. Uh, this is a uh, package that uh, corresponds to a book called Companion to Applied Regression. Uh, in fact I uh, use that corresponding book when I teach a regression course. Um, so let's talk about how we can install that package. It's actually really simple. So I can come over here to Packages, Install Packages. And then we have what's called the CRAN mirror. CRAN stands for Comprehensive R Archive Network. And we have all these web servers all across the world that are essentially mirrors of one another, uh, meaning that they have all the exact same content on them in terms of these packages. And so I'm going to go down to one particular location, USA, Iowa. This is actually the uh, CRAN mirror that's uh, in the, for the Department of Statistics at Iowa State University. I'm going to click on OK. Could have used a different mirror if I wanted to. And then we have over 5,000 packages listed here. And so it can be kind of difficult sometimes trying to find what you're looking for. And we're looking for CAR. Let's see that a little bit higher. There we go. So if I just click on that and OK, and then what's going to happen is that R is going to download it and install it on your computer. I'm not going to do that here because I already have a uh, car installed. Now, once a package is installed on your computer, you don't need to reinstall it unless uh, perhaps uh, if you decide to update the version of R that you're using. Um, but if you want to actually use then the package, you need to use a function called library. And the first argument in that is called package. And if I specify library package equal car, now all the functions that are, that are in car are available for me to use. You need to do this in terms of this particular R session. If I were to close out R and then come back into it, I would not need to reinstall the package itself but I would still need to issue this particular command. Um, then on page 12, uh, a few more comments here. Uh, please note that, let me actually go there. Please note that object names uh, can include periods and underscores. So often what's done is if you, let's say, uh, try to create an object name that's descriptive and maybe 
would actually be more than one word if you were to read it out aloud. What's often done is a, a period is often used to separate the different words. So for example, if I'm going to, let's say, fit a regression model, and I want to save the results into something, into an object, I often use uh, uh, the object name mod.fit. Um, Note also that R is case sensitive, so a capital M is different from a lowercase m. And lastly, let's say that you want to actually exit R. Uh, you can come up here like you would normally in Windows and click on close. You have this little question that comes up and says, do you want to save your workspace image? What that basically means is that, that our database, which contains all the objects that we've created so far, can actually be saved and used later. Uh, typically, I never save it because I always have the code in a program. Uh, and you'll see how we can write a program later on. I always have that code in a program or a f uh, let's say a, a file. And so all I need to do is just simply rerun my code and I get all the same objects again. So I always will click no. Okay. So then that takes us to page 13. As I was kind of talking about, um, we are going to talk about uh, how, to, how to write a program for R. And a program is used when we have, let's say, a long list of commands that we need to, let's say, execute all at once. And we don't want to simply have to type all these commands one by one in the R console. Rather, what we would like to be able to do is have, a, let's say, a document that contains all the code. And maybe we could just uh, click on a button and send all that code into R so that it can be executed. Well, a very, very simple way that you could write a program is to use Notepad or some other text editor, even Word, um, and type all the lines of code that you want to run, and then you would have to manually highlight it, copy, and then go over to R and paste it in there. Instead, uh, what I strongly recommend that you do is use program editors that are available that make it a lot easier. We're going to talk about three main program editors here, uh, where the first one is one that's actually located in R itself. Um, and let me actually access it here. I click on File, New Script. That brings up then the, uh, the R editor uh, for writing programs. So for example, we've uh, done before save gets uh, 2 plus 2. And if I type save again, this is my program. I can save the program by clicking on File, Save. And notice it's going to come up with a .r extension. I can put the program wherever I want to, call it whatever I want to as well. I'm not going to save this one though. And then if I want to run this code, there's a few different ways to do it. If I highlight the code I want to run, click on Edit, Run Line or Selection. And notice what happens. It transferred all the code into my R console window. Alternatively, I could say run all, uh, for example, if I wanted to run my entire program. So this is a very, very simple editor. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, I recommend don't using this particular editor and instead uh, use one of the two other editors uh, that I'm going to talk about next. So the next editor that we're going to talk about is one called 10R. And let's go ahead and uh, get there. It was on page 15. Uh, you can uh, download it from this particular web address there. Um, you can also download it uh, from a GitHub address too. And this is a free Windows-based program uh, that is uh, basically an editor that's outside of R. And both the editor and uh, R can communicate with one another uh, through um, uh, some, some mechanisms that they have in place. Uh, note uh, that TIN stands for this is not notepad. Um, and most often people just call it TIN rather than the more formal TIN R. Uh, also note that your programs need to have an, a .R extension to them in order for uh, TIN R to work as, as we would like as shown shortly. Okay, so this is what 10R looks like when it is open. Uh, 
in its uh, default configuration. Uh, I have numbers uh, listed here with particular uh, icons that are shown on toolbars and we'll talk about all those shortly. Uh, now what I'm going to do is show you my 10R. I've actually customized it a little bit and I'll talk about some ways to do that uh, to do that uh, shortly too. Um, and so what we have here right now is uh, the uh, a program called initial examples.r and basically all the stuff that we've been doing so far in R are located in this particular program here. Um, and one of the first things that you'll notice is that we have what's called syntax highlight, meaning that depending upon the purpose of a set of code, it is highlighted uh, to be a different color. And we didn't see that before with the R program editor, and that's one of the strengths of using a program editor like TIN itself, because it helps you see what's being displayed much, much easier. And so, for example, here, um, if a line begins with a pound sign in R, um, that corresponds to what's called a comment. And a comment is just a way to uh, say, okay, this is what this program does or what this is what this code does. And it's just mainly uh, uh, for, the, for the reader uh, of a code to understand what's going on. Uh, we also have, let's say, the, uh, the word function uh, highlighted in red to emphasize, yes, that this is a function. Okay. So now, in order to use R with TIN, uh, we can come up here to, the, to this particular toolbar and we can actually open up R. So I'm going to uh, click on that. And you notice that uh, this looks a little bit different from what we've actually seen before. This is what we had before. And this then highlights then two different ways to interact with R. Uh, one's called SDI for single display interface. That's what that's shown here. And one is called MDI for multiple display interface. Uh, the main difference between the two is you notice that this R console window, and if I were to open up a graphics window, you'll see us do this later, uh, it would all be enclosed with inside this R GUI, uh, graphical user interface. Let me exit out of there. Now, with uh, the SDI um, version, uh, basically for everything that you do, a new window will pop up. So if I were to create a graph, a new graph window would pop up, and it would be outside of the R, um, outside of this window here for the R console. Okay, so, you know, when I started R, uh, again, what I did was I clicked on this uh, R uh, icon here. There was like a... Um, a, a, it was kind of highlighted in green. Now it's highlighted in red, uh, indicating that if I were to click on it again, it would close out um, uh, the R console window. Also, when I originally clicked on the R icon, it took a little bit for everything to get ready to run. Uh, that's because when when you open up uh, R in this manner, uh, various um, additional packages have to be loaded in order to interface um, uh, with TIN and R. And in fact, the very first time that you ever will use TIN, a new package will be installed uh, that will allow you to interface uh, with, with the R console window here. Okay, so how can I use then TIN? Well, it's simply, if I want to, let's say, run this segment of code um, here, all I need to do is highlight it, come up here to this toolbar, R send selection echo equal true, meaning that I want to see the actual code that's being sent to it after it's actually um, run. I click on that and look what happens. All the code is transferred then to the R console window. Uh, just kind of a quirk with working with uh, TIN, um, you notice that there are blank lines between every single um, line of code that's actually being sent. Uh, uh, that's just uh, the default behavior of TIN. Uh, when I actually um, uh, will create, let's say, answer keys or, or lecture notes for this class, I will actually uh, copy and paste some of this code outside uh, from our console to Word, and I will actually remove those um, um, blank lines manually. Okay. 
There's other ways that you can send uh, code to TIN as well. And I urge you just to take a look at and try on your own some of these other icons where you see my mouse is right now to see the behavior of, of what happens. I primarily just use this uh, R send selection echo equal true of way of sending code. Okay, so now on page 16 of the notes, I have a number of different uh, comments about using TIN. Uh, I want you to read them all. I'm only going to highlight a few of them here. Um, uh, a lot of this has to do deal with the default behavior of working with TIN. And I, at least my preference and preference of others is to change some of the de default behavior so that it works better. Okay. So one of the first things, this is uh, actually the, the second bullet on page uh, 16, is that, let me turn off the default, turn on the default behavior, um, is that if I were to highlight this code, and then again send it to R, look what happens. Well, it was sent to R, I'm going to do it again, but it's sent so fast, uh, you don't see what the actual result is, and you don't have an opportunity to immediately see the R console window. Now that's the default behavior of working with TIN. Instead what we would uh, like to do is that once we send code from TIN to R is that we'd like to actually examine what happened with the R console window. And so to, to change that behavior from the default to uh, what I actually showed you the first time I, I showed you transferring code is you come up here to this options, return focus after send control R GUI. So right now it's set to a point where uh, you won't be able to see immediately uh, what, what happened in the R, R console. So if I uh, click on that and now send my code, notice my R console always stays on top after uh, the code is uh, sent. Okay, so next on page 17, I discuss how, let me actually go there. I discuss how long lines of code are wrapped to a new line by default. What that means is you might see something like this. Let's see if I have any long lines of code. Eh, maybe a little bit. You might see wrapping uh, like this so that everything is still on one screen, it doesn't go off the screen. Uh, I, I prefer not to have that done, and so one way to change that is to click on Options, um, Applications, or Application, Editor, and then select Line Wrapping, select the No Radio button. Okay. Uh, another important thing uh, about using TIN is um, the default behavior, if you were to, let's say, send a whole long list of lines of code, um, what will happen is that maybe only some of the code is actually shown then in the R console. The reason being is because um, the, the authors of TIN re recognize that if you have a long list of code sent, you might not want to see it all being, let's say, echoed into the R console window. You only want to see the important parts coming back to you. Um, and what I prefer and what I uh, encourage students to do is to change that behavior so everything that you send to the R console is actually shown. Uh, one reason is because for projects you will need to show me all your code that you're running and that will mean maybe transferring code from 10R to, to the R console and then highlighting all of it and pasting it into a Word document. So anyway, so to change the, uh, from the default behavior, uh, where only maybe uh, parts of the code is actually shown in the R console that's, uh, that, uh, for the code that's being run, click on Options, Application, and uh, let's see here, R, Basic, and the th most important thing is this right here. You want to change that from the default. I've already changed that. And what this is is a very, very, very large number, which corresponds to the number of characters uh, that will be actually echoed or shown in the R console. And as long as you have an extremely large number here, 
uh, for all purposes in our class, all the R code that's transferred to the R console will actually be shown. Now, one way that I like to actually use TIN is not in a, let's say, a, uh, a single window uh, for my computer, but I have actually, have, um, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. Rather than, let's say, using a single monitor for my computer, I have multiple monitors where I'll put the TIN window in one monitor, I put the R console window in another monitor uh, so that I don't have to flip back and forth between the two to see the results of uh, some code that was run in R. Uh, another way that you can do it, and since I can only record here uh, one, one monitor at a time, this will, this will be helpful to see here, is that what you can do is, let's say, move or dock your, uh, your TIN window on one portion of your monitor, and then move and dock uh, the other uh, R console window in one portion of your monitor. And so that, if you range them right, if I only had one monitor right now, I could easily um, just move this over to the edge and, and Windows will automatically dock it for me. But you can just highlight the code, run it, and you can see them side by side how everything is, is working. Okay, so that's using 10R. Um, uh, this is what I use pretty much for everything. I will tell you one other thing, some other things that I've done is I've actually changed some of the, uh, the syntax highlighting so that it's, I don't know, I think it's a little bit um, uh, clearer to see. So when you actually download TIN yourself, you're going to see the syntax highlighting to be a little bit different. Uh, you can control syntax highlighting by again going under options and application. Um, now, another editor that is used for uh, with R is something called R Studio. This again is a free um, uh, something free. Uh, the program is uh, the website to download the program is uh, located on page 19 of my notes. Uh, formerly, this is called the Desktop R Studio, which is made by the company called R Studio, but most people just call it R Studio. And uh, this came out oh about 2010, and this since uh, has become the most widely used um, editor for using R. There's some aspects of it that I don't like, and I prefer Tin better, and so that's why I still use Tin. Uh, but uh, this is the most widely used by far now nowadays. And it's actually not necessarily just an editor. It's actually a, uh, what's called an IDE, uh, Integrated Development Environment, meaning up here towards the top, you can see a place where you can type your code and embedded inside the R Studio window itself is an R Console window. Also over here on the right hand side, you see access to help. You see a, a tab here for plots. This is where graphs will go. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you'll be able to see over here too. Um, and so that's why, especially for those who are coming from SAS, where they're kind of used to this kind of environment, um, they tend to uh, gravitate towards using R Studio. Uh, note here with the R con, I'm sorry, with the program editor window, uh, we do have syntax highlighting again. The syntax highlight I don't think is as good as Tim. That's one reason why I use Tim. But if I want to run some code from it, I can just highlight the code, come over here to run, and it's transferred to my R console really simply. Okay. Uh, on page 21, uh, it talks about, uh, my, of my notes, it talks about some other ways that you can um, use uh, or some other highlights of using our studio. Uh, in particular, it has some uh, ways to uh, do code suggestions where you maybe you're unsure about, let's say, some options for a function like pnorm. Um, our studio can suggest, um, or I, I'm sorry, can give you the arguments to help you out. And I'll let you explore those on your own. On the bottom page 21 then, let me get there. Uh, I want to mention that there are lots of other editors um, 
uh, that you can use by far 10 in our studio are the ones that my students use the most. I've used in the past a lot of editor called WinEdit um, with our WinEdit uh, add-on to it. Um, the one problem is with WinEdit, it's shareware, it's not free. Um, so that's why I ended up stop using it. And also a, a big um, big editor that's used um, uh, uh, by Linux users is Emacs and there's an add-on with it called Emacs Speaks Statistics. So, so that's the end of then using a program editor. I strongly, strongly recommend that you use either 10R or RStudio in this class because we'll have some long programs and will make your life a lot simpler if you invest the time to learn how to use one of those editors.